Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our seminar today, which is devoted to the theme of promoting accountability, how to better monitor progress against structural barriers in the HIV response. Uh, I am joining you from France, just on the other side of the border of Geneva, where I'm based at UNAIDS. My name is Helena nygren Krug, and I work at UNAIDS as Senior Advisor, and I'm really, really excited to be here with you today. I'm excited for many reasons. Uh, one is that we're grappling with the how. How can we monitor better to reach um, these structural barriers and address them? We're acutely aware of why we need to do it. And we now need to really grapple with the how. UNAIDS is in the process of developing its next global AIDS strategy. And the question of how has been featuring in every discussion. And we've had about 10,000 participants joining our discussions on how to develop the next UNAIDS strategy. And the question of how has been front and center of those debates. Um, I'm so excited as well to be with you because we have four excellent speakers who are going to take us from different levels, global, regional, national, to look at this question of how. We have Professor Ron, Laron Nelson, who's going to be looking at racial and social disparities so long neglected in the HIV response. We have Karen Dunaway, who's going to be looking at gender and youth. We have, have Eldred Tellis, who's going to take a deep dive in the whole issue of COVID-19 and really looking on the ground at how that is impacting services in India to ensure harm reduction, reaching people who use drugs. And last but not least, to tie the knot and, and give us a very practical tool to go forward is Matt Kavanagh, who's a professor at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health in the United States. So a really exciting agenda that we have uh, in front of us. It's gonna be a marathon uh, hour. So to keep the discussion going at all fronts, um, we would recommend that you pop questions to the speakers in the Q&A during the seminar. And also please feel free to make comments uh, in the chat box and let's keep this as lively as we can. Uh, we'll hopefully have 20 minutes for discussion at the end as well. So. Um, Let's, let's keep time uh, as we go along. Uh, before I start, however, I want to say just a few days, a few words about why I'm also excited about being here um, because it's the 10th of December and that is Human Rights Day. As you know, it is the day in 1948 when the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the General Assembly and center in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is freedom from discrimination. But we know that discrimination is entrenched in our societies and we've seen how COVID is fueled by discrimination and has deepened inequalities across societies. We've known this for a long time from the HIV response and we have already started developing tools to monitor disparities, to monitor inequalities. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So I think it's really, pertinent that we have this discussion today. The theme of Human Rights Day for 2020 is recover better. So let's hear from our panelists how we can monitor and hold those in power to account as we recover better, both from the COVID pandemic and in our efforts to end AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. So with no further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to our first panelist, Professor Laron Nelson, who is Associate Dean for Global Affairs and Planetary Health and Professor at Yale School of Nursing. And he is going to talk about measuring racial and social disparities and promoting accountability in the HIV response and beyond. Laron, the floor is yours. Thank you, Helena. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, I want to start today by uh, talking about racial and social disparities with a reflection on a, a, a film that I watched recently. Uh, this is, you may have seen it, but it's called uh, Nine to Five. 
It's a movie uh, that was uh, maybe it's about 40 years old uh, now. And it was an interesting film uh, that one of the elements of it, it's an office environment. There are three women protagonists who are sort of trying to make their way working through a, a place that is oppressive through these multiple systems that play that are sort of um, impacting them in particular ways. And one thing that struck me as I watched it uh, again uh, was this idea of they collected data about what was making it, what would have made the environment better. And uh, so they did things like uh, shared work time, uh, allowing people to get uh, to work part time and I have to work full time. I think they set up a daycare in the office, various things that made uh, working in that environment uh, more equitable for women. And then one, one of the things that they proposed was uh, having equal pay uh, between men and women who did the same job, that they would get paid the same wage. And it was a, when I saw that scene, it was a little bit, I kind of chuckled because it seemed so outrageous. I mean, it was not a comedic scene at all, but it's it, the, the idea of it seemed bizarre as I watched it uh, as an adult in 2020. And it made me think, I mean, it was bizarre that, that somebody would say, oh, I know what it was. The, the proposal was for men and women to make the same wage if they did the same job. And the boss, the chairman of the board kind of said, okay, okay, calm down. Don't don't go overboard with all these changes. That was too far fetched at the time. So to me, that was a bit outrageous uh, and bizarre to hear, because I never lived, at least in my adult time, with the idea that women would that would be far fetched that women would make a different pay from men. But it also made me think about where we are now in terms of racial disparities uh, in the HIV response, in the general health response. And the idea that we can have these disparities year after year and it not seem bizarre, that it not be so outrageous and outlandish because the idea of these pay disparities by gender is unacceptable, but it wasn't unacceptable 40 years ago, not universally to the degree that it is now. And it also makes me think that the idea of the impact of racism has not reached a level of outrageousness in human society, that it becomes unacceptable. And that's where we need to be. So you see on this slide here is these four dimensions of racism. There may even be more than four, but uh, what we focus mostly on in general are interpersonal forms, which are forms of racism that happen between people. But they're more than one form. <laughs> Uh, and we need to be focused on more than just the interpersonal interactions between racialized groups of people and individual people. And I'll argue too that the most impactful forms, particularly relevant to the HIV response, are what happens at the institutional level and the structural level. Uh, particularly because institutional level forms actually uh, are the environment in which interpersonal forms of racism persist. Uh, and the structural level is what helps uh, the institutional level forms of racism uh, work between uh, each other. So the first thing we have to do uh, in trying to address these inequities is to measure them, to collect the evidence. That means documenting the impact of inequitable social policies. Inequitable, I need to go back one slide. Inequitable social policies on the norms uh, policies and norms on health outcomes, including HIV. So this includes understanding racialized impacts, gendered impacts, impacts based on class, uh, impacts based on age, and other groups of privilege and marginalization. So there, is, there are some instances where, uh, for example, I know in Canada right now, uh, there's not systematically collecting data on race, right? It's hard to understand what's happening with the population if we don't have evidence uh, on that population. There are places, even in the United States, but in, in parts of Africa where I do work, uh, where there's not, there's not data collected on sexual minority status or sexual behavior among men who have sex with men. 
So it is hard to understand at next level what's happening with uh, inequities in communities when those data are not systematically collected, at least in epidemiological systems. So it's important that to first that these data be collected, that they, they also be collected, not just at the state national level, but within institutions as well, uh, to understand how services are being provided, where gaps in services are, and how those gaps look across uh, individual groups who come to your community-based programs or to your clinical practices. Another aspect of measuring inequities uh, can also happen at the national com or community level. Uh, what you see on your screen is Urban Heart. It's a tool that's been endorsed by the World Health Organization uh, that includes four domains that are, it will be important to understand how these things are impacting health of communities and disparities that you see. That includes social and human development, economics, governance, and the physical environment and infrastructure. Uh, there's also a state level racism index. This has been used mostly in the United States and it calculates racial disparity scores across four domains, the education domain, economics, employment, and incarceration. Uh, these are important because the, the inequities that we see across groups are not because of the groups, they're because of the social characteristics of communities that marginalize these groups and privilege other, other groups of people. So once the evidence is collected, it's important to then understand, uh, inspect the evidence. So the question will be, are there patterns in the evidence that you're seeing? Are there patterns in the data? And it's very clear if they're not random then they're built in, uh, they're systematic, they're part of the system. Once those data are inspected, the next challenge then is to understand the evidence to examine the social and political drivers that are influencing the patterns that you see. This includes what are the organizational practices and policies that contribute to these inequities that is at the institutional level? How are these inequities reinforced across institutions, which is at a structural level? And then also what are the incentives that reinforce these inequities, which is the political economy? Because if these inequities persist over time, it is because they're benefiting someone or some group at the same time that they're disadvantaging other groups. And then the fourth thing is to act on the evidence. So once we have the evidence, it's been inspected, uh, there's been some sense of socially contextualizing it and understanding it without pathologizing the people who are impacted by it. Uh, it is, uh, the next step is to use the evidence. And it's important to note that the data alone will not solve the problem, but it can help promote accountability. So it could help set targets. It could help uh, facilitate cross-sectoral collaborations to address the evidence. It could facilitate better monitoring of change. And it can also help us to know when to escalate the situation. Because even if you have data and evidence, the changes that we need to reduce these disparities are not likely to just be handed to us or to you or to communities or to, to the people who it's impacting, but it will have to be taken or seized or forced uh, in some way. And so this is the example of, or the lesson, if you will, of nine to five, in that evidence is foundational, it is essential, it will not be enough. It will still require some action. Uh, and we ha also have to be prepared in communities to take action to make sure we can reduce, we can make this evidence work and reduce these disparities. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really excellent and uh, has really set the tone underscoring the first thing we need is the evidence and we need to document. And I feel embarrassed as a UN employee to say that in the UN, despite the World Conference Against Racism in 2001 and all the rhetoric around leaving no one behind, I don't see systematic collection of data disaggregated by race across the UN system. So thanks, uh, Laurent, for, for underscoring this. I think we have a lot to do in this area. Um, and without further ado, uh, I want to move on to Eldred Tellis, who is the, um, uh, no, sorry, first Karen, apologies, Karen first, who's an IAS youth champion and representative of the international community of women 
Latina, and she's going to talk about gender and accountability and how to meaningfully measure progress and ensure programs are gender responsive. So let's move over to Karen. And remember, you can post questions in the chat box to Laron, um, and we'll also uh, be able to discuss further at the end of the presentations. Over to you, Karen. Thank you. Um, hi, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Uh, here it's, it's in really early in the morning. My name is Karen Dunaway. I am part of the International Community of Women Living on DJB in the Latina chapter in Latin America. And the youth area started its project. Let me talk to you a little bit about our project that we are doing. I can move this slide up there. The project that we're doing in the IAS Youth Champion Program, it's called We Know We Can't, uh, led by the ICW Latina Youth Area. The ICW Latina Youth Area started in 2017 and early 2020, we started in the IAS Youth Champion Program. The main objective of the project is to strengthen political advocacy agendas through data analysis of the situation of the young women with HIV in four countries, two in Central America and two in South America. That is Argentina, Chile, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Uh, we are going to do a situation analysis of data disaggregation. And based on that, we are going to do a political advocacy plan. Uh, these are us, the five uh, young women who are working on this project. I can move this slide. Thank you. What we did, what we are doing, and what are we going to do? What we did already is data collection and, and analysis of the collected documents. We also have a very, very rough draft of the situational report, but once we do the women's circle, uh, the situational report will be done. The women's circle, it's a empirical analysis, may I say? It's to put a face on the numbers. It's to have a human side on the investigation and to hurt in first person the experiences of us young women living with HIV in the health services, in the social environment, and even within the families. And once we have our situational report, uh, we can triangulate all the information, we are going to write an advocacy plan. And then we're going to present all the results, uh, the results on the situation report and the advocacy plan. But during our data collection, I don't know if I'm moving the slices. So can you please uh, next? <laughs> Thank you. So in our data collection process that it took like three months, uh, we found some difficulty about uh, finding those disaggregated data in in the four countries. Next, please. In Argentina, uh, there is no accurate records of health services among young people living with HIV. But uh, we found some semi-structured uh, interviews from the study named Characteristics of Women Recently Diagnosed with HIV in Argentina. But it was from eight years ago. And it was done by a community-based network the Argentina Network of Positive, Positive Women. In Argentina, there's information about access to HIV prevention, but there's no information about access to health services. There's a comprehensive care <clears throat> guide for women living with HIV, but there is no data on how many women have access to the HPV vaccine or the PAP test that it's called smear test, I think. And, Cynthia, the one who's responsible for acquiring all the Argentina data, said that Argentina has information on the stigma and discrimination because social organizations have influenced a study on stigma and discrimination for many years, but because there was a big concern of the subject at that time. But now we need to have information. Sorry, something popped up in my... But we have to have information about what interests us which is access to sexual and reproductive health. Uh, next, please. Thank you. 
in Chile, uh, according to UNAIDS, the last report on UNAIDS on Chile, there's no data on the numbers of women living with HIV who have developed cervical cancer. And in, in both countries, in Argentina and Chile, they have this uh, transparency law that you can ask for public access and you can ask for access to public information and we did that in Chile. We request information through the transparency lab from the Minister of Health, but we never got a response. Um, we asked for the information like June, early June, the deadline was August and till now we never heard of them. Um, there is no data available on the number of young women living with HIV between the ages of 15 to 29, that is the, our population target that we are studying, uh, who have access to HPV vaccine. And even the Ministry of Health guidance called AUGE do not have a recommendation about um, the HPV vaccine for women to do the HPV vaccine. Sara, the one who's responsible for the data collection in Chile, said that the obstacle, it was all the data we tried to gather because of the, so the, the, the same invisibility that one, a woman with HIV have developed in the public policies that affect people with HIV. Next, please. Thank you. Honduras was one of the most difficult because there's so little data and um, and the one, the one that we found, it's not age segregated on the stigma and discrimination. There is no data on access to HPV vaccine or the pop test or the smear test. There's no gender desegregated data available. There's also this secret, secret law, secretivity law that is used by many um, government offices to justify non-provision of information that is sometimes required. And there's a lot of outdated information. Um, Kenya, who is responsible for Honduras, said that the most difficult thing is that only general data was found. Next, please. And lastly, Nicaragua, according to the data collected by uh, this uh, organization called Women of Leadership, only two out of 10 young women um, have access to contraception after the first delivery. However, this is for all women. There is no disaggregated data to understand access for young women living with HIV. In Nicaragua, we also face an obstacle that some key actors like organizations um, and other corporations, corporation, I think is the word, did not answer our request for a collaboration for us to, to we reached to them to ask if they have investigations, if they have any data available on young women. We never heard of them too. And the information available was general and not specific to young women living with HIV also. Uh, Carla, the one responsible for Nicaragua, said the data we found were from general populations and not disaggregated by gender. And the studies are not up to date and mostly talk about prevention and education of STIs. STIs or STDs. Next, please. Overall, in the foreign countries, we, we saw that there's no gender disaggregated data. The information available was so out of date. We even found one last uh, report. I don't remember the, the name that it was, that the lattice was like 2002 or 2003. Uh, many guidelines from the Ministry of Health were outdated and did not specifically recommend HPV vaccines and PAP tests or smear tests for women living with HIV, young women living with HIV. A little support from key actors. There is no transparency law for public access in Central America. Most information in Latin America is about prevention and not um, data evidence. There's a vast difference on access to information between Central and South America. And the most important that, that we can, um, our most important conclusion is that the lack of disaggregated data is one of the primary barriers for an advocacy plan with specific actions. Next. So how can we improve? 
governments have to comply with international treaties for the promotion and protection of the sexual and reproductive health for women living with HIV, young women living with HIV, like um, the CEDA, that the parties must ensure conditions of equality between men and women. And also, um, I think specifically the Article 13 of the American Convention of Human Rights, that is the right to access information. Also, we have to talk to those who make the politics, who make the decisions, and no longer among ourselves, um, organizations, because we know that this is necessary. And advocacy agendas uh, and actions must be dedicated and targeted to. And it's also extremely important for us to continue developing the skills of women with HIV in order to integrate these decision makers into the advocacy agendas. In our project, we have a political advocacy workshop integrated and budgeted because we know that we need it and it's necessary for young women to know these things. Um, the public policies of the countries should have indicators that respond to the sexual and reproductive health of young women with HIV, not general indicators. For example, number of women, young women with HIV who had access to a smear test. And the, the monitoring and evaluation that exists right now at this moment is not in our favor and we should update all the protocols and all the indicators because it's not working. Next. Uh, well, um, that's everything in my presentation. If you have any questions about our project, uh, you can email us or go to our website. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for that uh, regional perspective going uh, across countries, really useful and really interesting to hear the stories. We often talk about community monitoring and how exciting it is, but in practice, the struggles of getting information, of writing to government officials and not hearing back and all those nuts and bolts of monitoring that we need to be reminded of and think about our different roles, how we can support civil society and, and make this happen and set targets and indicators that are meaningful with communities and making sure that communities have the tools and the space to be able to get the information and, and move the agenda forward. So really interesting. Um, thank you, Karen, for that. Um, now we're going to move to India and we have Eldred Tellis, who is the founding director of the Sankal Rehabilitation Trust. And we're gonna hear uh, about the challenges in the COVID-19 context of uh, the work that he is doing there and the monitoring work. Over to you, Eldred. Yes, good day to everyone. It's uh, early morning in the US, afternoon in Europe and late, late evening here in Mumbai. So without much ado, um, we will look at my next slide, it's okay. The um, clients that we work with, we deal with street-based drug uh, injectors and almost 70% of them are homeless migrants. Uh, these are migrants because Mumbai or Bombay, as it was called, attracts people from all over the country being the financial capital of India. And people think that they have their pot of gold at the end of the rainbow here. Most of our clients are unemployed and between the ages of 18 to 50, we deal with adults basically. Some are daily wage earners, 95% of them are male and 5% are a female. Now, when I talk about daily wage earners, Basically, the drug users are either begging, which they do at religious places, at temples or mosques or churches, or they help with uh, being porters at railway stations, carrying luggage from the local train to the trains that go out of the state, from state to state. And some of them are involved in petty theft. All this gets impacted uh, with COVID. So what happens during the lockdown. No work for them because all religious places are shut, train stations shut. 
therefore they don't have regular meals. We had a lot of people offering meals, but it was not very well organized. So there were times when people would be coming in certain areas even four times a day. And there were times when they did not even come once a day. So with lack of organization, sometimes there were no meals. No general health care because many of the hospitals suddenly turned into only COVID hospitals. And therefore, uh, people with other problems presenting, like the drug users with the abscesses, with other routine problems could not get assistance, especially with abscess management. Service delivery disruption as we see it. With the lockdown, there was no transportation at all. Buses, trains, everything stopped for almost 75 days. We had a complete lockdown, one of the biggest lockdowns in the entire world. And so there was absolute disruption. Most of our staff, because we don't pay fancy salaries, they come from far out of Mumbai at the peripheral areas. So they could not reach because they do not have the ability to travel by train. And some of us, including myself, I had to accommodate myself in the admin office and some people lived in the detox center just to keep the services running. Outreach was done in a two kilometer radius, which could be done on foot. So within two kilometers of our drop-in center. We had to do advocacy. When I talk of MDAX, it is the Mumbai District Aid Society. So for oral substitution, which was done on a daily basis, we had to keep the, in the complete lockdown, we had to be open once a week. So we should give them oral substitution to take home dose. We use buprenorphine, so it's comparatively safer to give us take home dose compared to methadone. Advocacy with police for our needle exchange services because they were not very happy with people uh, you know, meeting together on the streets or doing anything, handling things. And they were trying to chase away many of the drug users in such what we call hot spots. So we had to advoc do advocacy with the police and the municipal corporation for those who shifted their proximity to come nearer to her drop-in center. So we had people who live on the streets anyway, but they came to streets which were nearer to the place where we were offering our services. And... Um, What other services were continued? Initially, the drop-in center opened just once a week. But as we came out of the first phase of the complete lockdown, we increased it to six times a week. But the staff were responding to four days a week. Even today, they respond only to four days a week. Our lockdown is still not completely eased because we still don't have the train services for all. A minimum one meal a day was taken on by us to distribute where others would sometimes get the next meal, but we would make sure that we took on the distribution of one meal a day. Distribution of dry ration for those who had families who had the ability to cook. They were cooking still on the, on the streets, but if they had a family, they had vessels, they had some provision to cook, we would give them dry rations itself. And those who wanted detoxification, it was given free of charge because they were finding it difficult to reach for OST if they were living far from our drop-in centers. Our outreach, the needle and syringe exchange was done only within a radius of about two kilometers where people could walk. But as you can see in the picture, we had our mobile clinic. So I myself, because there was no other driver, would go to places a little beyond this two kilometers to provide needles and syringes where there was a dire necessity for it. Abscess management was also done on the streets. And this, our peer educators and our outreach workers worked tirelessly through this time. Some people with really bad abscesses were refused treatment in hospitals. And one of our clients actually rotted to death with gangrene because he wasn't accepted in the hospital and he could not move too far away. We continued referral for emergency services. And in that case, even if we had to lift people ourselves physically and take them, we would do that. We gave assistance to all our clients who were receiving antiretroviral therapy, which they had to pick up once a month from the ART centers. So we would pick it up for, I think, about 56 people and distribute it ourselves, even give some home delivery. Very important 
was the hepatitis C treatment with sofuspivir, which was started by our government free. The treatment centers, some of them just decided to stop the treatment midway. And we had to again advocate to continue this treatment where we would take our clients to these centers so that there was no uh, break in their treatment. Looking at uh, the COVID prevention, um, we had to provide masks for all our clients. We're talking again about street-based clients, especially those who are coming daily for OST, they got their masks, maintain safe distancing as you see outside in the picture, try and keep them at least a foot, uh, a, a meter away from each other outside the drop-in center. We provide sanitizers for everyone who came in for services, entered the DIC. We distributed soaps, almost 4,000 soaps we distributed for good hand washing. Um, of course, the question is, were they getting good enough water as well? Because on the streets, that's something of a commodity that needs to be given as well. We conducted meetings for small groups of just eight people because we had to maintain social distancing. And we conducted COVID-19 tests. Here we had a problem because there were people who did not have proper identification. And so they were not being given um, the COVID tests. And this is something we've taken up for advocacy that our clients have to get the test taken because if they don't get tested, then our staff are in really uh, compromised position. And many, all the COVID prevention messages. I will briefly go through um, findings of our survey. In the middle of this, we did a survey with about 100 people who were not accessing our OST, who were outside on the peripheries. And we found that 60% had only primary or no education. So the messages on holdings failed to reach them. They couldn't read it. And in the absence of TVs or smartphones for them, there was none of that available. They weren't really getting the messages. We had 45% shifting from using injecting in groups to using a loan, which in a way would be uh, good that some of the bloodborne viruses may be reduced, the transmission, because now 44% shifted to using a loan. Almost 90% of them had no work or were earning much less than before. And they found survival very, very difficult. Due to the work with us doing within walking radius, 35% of our clients were unable to access clean needles or syringes. These are people who are beyond the area that we could cover on a daily basis. And uh, this became again a risk factor. 90% found it very difficult to difficult to get general treatment in hospitals. They found that whenever they were going, they were shooed away saying this is only COVID hospital. And they found it very difficult to travel on foot five to six kilometers away to get general treatment. So they were left without. Although almost 70% felt they may get infected, this was their own perception, 77% said that they needed more information on COVID. So this is another finding that shows that the COVID information wasn't reaching them. And I think I have run out of time, but I would once more like to say that our advocacy has to carry on to see that services are made available, that people on the margins are allowed to uh, get the services that they need. And uh, especially without identification, people on the street should get the COVID test. Thank you. Thank you, Eldred. Uh, amazing. I commend you uh, for this incredible work and for sharing it with us and underscoring the importance of the holistic people-centered approach where you've talked about basic necessities from soap to clean water to all the health interventions across uh, needle and syringe programs, hepatitis C and COVID prevention and doing a survey in the midst of this um, extraordinary work. And I'm sure our uh, participants would like to hear more about it. But without further ado, I want to turn to Matt Kavanaugh. And I feel very honored and privileged to introduce Matt because, um, of course, you all know him as the Director of Global uh, Health Policy at the O'Neill Institute. But he is also co-chair of the UNAIDS advisory group that is advising UNAIDS where I work and Winnie Biadima, the executive director on the transition phase of UNAIDS and the development of our global AIDS strategy and doing extraordinary work, challenging us every time and really 
yeah, <laughs> raising all the issues um, that need to be raised that not everyone dares to do. So Matt, um, very excited to hear from you now talking about um, the HIV Policy Lab. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Helena, and thanks to um, thanks to the IAS for for putting this on. Um, it's really fantastic to hear all of the the powerful presentations thus far about kind of how do we how do we really monitor um, things to move them. I'm going to briefly walk through a piece that I think follows well on what we've heard so far, right? About how do we think about the structural drivers of HIV? One of which is the law and policy environment. How do we think about changing that? And so the presentation from Latin America about how these transformations are possible through advocacy is critical. And then Eldred coming in to talk about how do communities monitor whether services are actually being delivered. Another layer that we want to put on top of that is to really think about how does law and policy actually move us along. So we are, um, the science of HIV at this point has never been better. Um, we know that to be true and yet we are not on track to hit the global HIV goals. Um, it would be tempting, I think, next slide, it would be tempting to think that after decades in the global AIDS response, we would in fact assume that most countries have adopted the right policies with maybe a few outliers, but this is not the case. So next slide. Um, the, this is a, a picture of the PrEP policies worldwide. And the blue that you see here are the countries whose PrEP policies are aligned with WHO recommendations. And what we see is that most countries have not yet aligned with on PrEP. And so that makes us think, can we in fact measure, monitor, and then change HIV policies around the world? Next slide. So the HIV Policy Lab, and I'm just gonna run through it very briefly because just have a few moments to do so, tries to bring a bunch of these pieces together. It's a data and visualization platform. We also just put out the um, our first global report, um, which has which is online at hivpolicylab.org. Um, and what we've done is to track 33 different policy indicators across all 194 countries in four years of data and counting. Next slide. The, what we've done is to say, for each of these 33 indicators, let's ask a very specific question. So this is the South Africa um, scorecard. You can see a few of the clinical questions that are asked, right? For example, is the option to start treatment the same day as HIV diagnosis included in national policy, right? So each of the 33 areas, it's everything from clinical policies to testing, prevention, criminalization under structural drivers, things like that, and then health systems policies, like are countries imposing user fees or not? Next slide, please. And then when we roll these up together, we can say, all right, let's see about clinical and treatment program policies, testing and prevention policies, structural policies, and health system policies. And we can see, for example, here, South Africa is the country in the world that has adopted the most policies that are aligned with UNAIDS, WHO, um, UNDP, and other global standards. Um, and, and yet here we can see that even UNA, or even South Africa has a ways to go to adopt 100%. No country in the world, when we look at these, has adopted all of the policies that WHO and UNAIDS across these 33 core indicators. Not one country has adopted them all. And so this helps explain why we haven't made more progress. Next slide. What we can do then if we actually measure policy is we can say, where are countries along the way? And so this is a snapshot of the Asia Pacific region, right? And I won't go through all of these, but what you can see is that again, no country in the world has adopted all these core policies. And that Thailand in the Asia Pacific region is by far, is far ahead of other countries when it comes to aligning HIV policies with international standards. Um, but many countries have not even reached the kind of what we consider the most category, and that is a challenge. Next slide. Several of the countries that are the most um, on track, that have made the best progress are those countries um, that have adopted the most policies. Back, back one, please. Um, so Thailand, for example, right, is the, has adopted the most policies. They are far and away ahead of um, other countries when it comes to the 90, 90, 90 targets. Next slide. And yet many of the countries that are facing the fastest rising new infections and rising deaths are those that, are, that have a policy environment that is least aligned with 
um, with uh, international standards. The Philippines, for example, has seen a 338% increase in death since 2010. We think a lot of that is attributed to the fact that their policy environment is so, so misaligned. Next. Next slide. And so what we can also look when we measure HIV policy, we can actually look at which policies are more adopted or less adopted. And so in this case, uh, in the Asia Pacific region alone, right, 40% of countries, only 40% of countries have actually adopted the newest HIV treatments to align with WHO guidelines, right? Only 22% have done so for children. Only 44% actually allow um, adolescents to get access to testing and treatment without parental consent. Right, 42% of countries continue to criminalize same-sex relations. Only 30% have laws in place that prohibit discrimination. Next slide. And so what we think overall, right, the goal here is that if we can, uh, if we think that policy matters, and we do, then we should measure it, we should monitor it, and we should change it. Because if we don't actually do that, if we don't pay attention to this, if we don't make this a key part of what's going to happen next, then we will not hit the global HIV goals that Helena mentioned, which is why I'm particularly pleased at the progress that's being made on a new strategy for UNAIDS that's actually really taking into account um, what this is, including setting what's known now as the 10-10-10 targets for policy change on some of the key areas of criminalization, which is fantastic. I'll, I'll leave it there and, and open to questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Matt, and you've just given us the evidence as well um, about the necessity of addressing the policy environment to make um, headway on the HIV response. It seems crystal clear when I look at that, and it's so clearly laid out visually, uh, very compelling. Measure, monitor, change. So. We're going to open the floor now. We have uh, five questions. Uh, two are to specific speakers. Um, so there's one specific one for Eldred about uh, going beyond helping young people on ART, not just to access grief, but to refill. Uh, that's for you, Eldred. And then there's also um, a specific one for um, Karen about uh, the next steps, your plan of action. Then there are a few general ones. Matt, this one I'll <laughs> give to you. What, are, what have been identified to be the, the main structural barriers today in the global <laughs> HIV response globally? And uh, then we have a question from Peter Kyoko Mukula who's a general question. How do we ensure consistent supply of ARVs during the pandemic where people have phobia now of visiting health facilities. Perhaps everyone could have a think about that. And then the last one is from Gita Seti. Uh, how can we empower communities to generate credible data as official mechanisms do not seem to be collecting the required data? Um, so over to you panelists. Um, I don't know who wants to start, any volunteers? Okay. Well, Matt, I can see Since you. you so. asked me a question. Oh, okay, Eldred, go ahead. You start. Over to you. Says, how are you helping young people on ART not able to access refill points to refill? Well, we are at the moment helping all our clients on ART to get their refills. So if there are others who want, in fact, recently I had during the, during the time of the pandemic, uh, a client who wasn't mine, MSM from, from Goa, and they just called me and said, help him to get his ART because he's shifting from Goa to Mumbai. And I was able to do that for him. And at the same token, just yesterday, somebody's come down from um, Punjab and wanted OST. So we are able to access through our own networks and get him OST from our drop-in center. So we do, wherever the requests come, we take them on. And I've uh, helped people who are not our clients as well to get the RT wherever possible. Thank you very much, Eldred. I think uh, we'll be re reassured to hear this. Um, so, Karen, do you want to take your specific question? Yes, it's actually a very short answer. Uh, though, um, we hoped uh, at the beginning of the year to be having plan of actions uh, now, but with COVID, we actually push, pushed all of our activities to early 2021. So 
So the warm, the woman's circle is still need to be done in order to have an understanding of all the data of young women with HIV. And once all the information is strangulated, we will discuss what are the best steps to work on next. Thank you. Um, so I'll turn to Matt next, but meanwhile, let me just give a question to Laurent. Um, it's posed to you, Dr. Nelson. What is the role of racism as a stru structural barrier to HIV care and prevention globally? In the US, you said it's a massive barrier as you have documented. Could you speak um, a little bit more at a, at a global level, if you know? Um, so I'll turn over to Matt um, and then back to Laurent on the, on the question specifically on racism. Over. Great, thanks, Elena. The core question on structural barriers. I think there's a there's a lot of really excellent work um, that's really demonstrated what what kind of what we mean by structural barriers, which is the ways in which society and laws and policies and social norms um, are constructed in ways that actually drive HIV directly. Right. So they prevent people from accessing services, but they also increase people's vulnerability really directly. And those include things like criminalization, right? We've seen again and again that criminalizing HIV transmission actually leads people away from being tested. We know that criminalizing sex work actually disempowers people from being able to, to take actions that would prevent the transmission of HIV. We know that criminalizing gay sex actually prevents people from, from being able to access services and makes HIV far, uh, far higher risk. But we also know that things like girls' education programs, right? The structural realities of do young women have access to education are structural drivers of, of HIV. Um, we also know, right, that the strength of civil society is actually one of the structural drivers of, of HIV. Where civil society is weak, we've actually seen less progress against HIV. And then where human rights are embedded into the constitution of countries, we've seen that actually to be a critical piece. Countries with the constitutional right to health actually have better health outcomes than those without. And so we think about these things together within the HIV policy lab, where we say we can measure these structural drivers in a policy way, right? There's lots of ways to measure them in, in multiple different ways. And, and um, you know, Professor Nelson was describing some of those, those kind of structural pieces when it comes to disparities. We can also do so on a policy and legal framework. We can actually measure it and see what that looks like. And if I, if I can, Helena, I see that there's also a question on the US, if I can just jump in to answer that while I'm while I'm speaking. Yeah, I was going to give you thinking time, but uh, you're no, sure quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I think it's a great, a great piece, right? Which is the, the question over here that is, you know, what work's been done within the US to examine the impact of HIV within the policy domains we're looking at? And, you know, I, I showed, I threw up there um, Asia Pacific, right? Which is, which is not where I live. I live in Washington, DC. And here, the United States actually scores relatively badly on the HIV policy lab. We have not aligned many of the laws and policies that would make sense with, with UN AIDS and, and WHO um, guidelines, including ironically, policies that PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, suggests that other countries need to adopt that are getting PEPFAR funding, we have not adopted here in the United States. And so there's a lot of work going on to try to do that. I think physicians in the, um, in the US have been particularly good at moving the clinical policies, but have been less good at moving some of the structural policies. We still see criminalization across the United States as an issue. We also know that many of the innovations within the health system that low and middle income countries have adopted like, for example, allowing nurses to initiate people on ART. That has not been adopted in the United States. It's been transformative for um, low resource communities around the world, and yet it's not been adopted here in the United States. So I think that one of the things we see from the HIV Policy Lab is that rich countries do not necessarily have the best policy environments. As much as rich countries would like to lecture the rest of the world about how, you know, what their policies should look like, often it's actually low and middle income countries that are leading the way on policies that are actually addressing HIV head on. And we have a lot to learn in the, in the global north. Over. Thank you. And I will say, you know, my response is, is it really tacks on to what Matthew just described. And that, you know, outside the United States, the impact of racism is that the, the issues that Matt talked about are not even distributed across all populations. So the, the different penalties, different ways that people are criminalized are applied differently if you're Black. <laughs> or brown, or if you're not. 
Uh, the barriers are the same, but how they're applied depends on uh, people's racial status in whatever social context or country that they're in. The ability to access things like education or housing or jobs, those are still very real structural barriers, but those barriers are applied differently depending on where you fall in the racial hierarchy. And so that happens in countries across the world, not just the United States. I think a main difference in the United States is at least, maybe it's not even at least, but there is some data that we that we know that allows us to understand what's happening and to be able to do something about it. I don't believe you have to have, I mean, in this environment, I think it is unreasonable to ask people to wait until sufficient data has been collected to, to address the oppression. <laughs> I think we're seeing that that is not a, a, a model that's gonna work <laughs> going forward, but it still needs, I don't think that means we should not make attempts to collect data to know to try to inform policy and to try to make things happen. But I think we see now that people who have been sort of pushed under the weight of this and having disproportionate exposure to HIV and other infectious diseases, or the health impacts uh, are fighting for their lives and for their rights, whether there's enough data to support policy change or not, uh, many places are, not, are just not gonna wait any longer for that. Thank you, Professor Nelson. I now have a question for Karen and a general comment. So Karen, thank you for your interesting presentation. However, what do you suggest to be specific actions to be taken beyond talking to leaders in response to lack of up-to-date data in the government system? And then a comment from Carlos, who's in Chile with the Positivo Foundation. He says he wants to share that in Chile, the Ministry of Health adopted PrEP as public policy, but this program was implemented one year ago and only has 254 people as registered users. The cause of this is the zero diffusion of the program and the benefits of PrEP and the incorrect language that was used at the beginning, very stigmatizing. So it's adopted, but it's not functional. That was a comment from Carlos in Chile. Um, over to you, Karen, for a response to the question, and then we're nearly at the top of the hour. Karen, over to you. I am actually not very surprised of what Carlos said, because of all the information that we found in Chile, it really has a lot of stigmatized uh, words under guidelines in the ministry. And um, answering the questions, most of the work that has been done in Latin America about uh, that data has been done on or has been done by the community-based organizations, but it has very limited resources, very limited on geographical terms, uh, limited on time frame. Therefore, I think that the very specific actions is to ensure that women have the skills to do this uh, analysis, to do this uh, investigations, to empower them to be informed and to be educated, and also to finance those programs in a long term. Thank you. And the question about uh, ARV supplies generally when people are afraid of visiting health facilities during COVID. Eldred, do you have any thoughts on that? And then I just want us everybody for a final comment thought from the panelists before we close. So Eldred, over to you. Uh, comment on, on supply of ARVs when people are fearful and also some final thoughts from you. Yes, um, uh, I think it's important that um, at least with our drug users, you know, because they are not educated enough that they should not be asked to go to these centers because sometimes you go to a center and you can catch COVID. On the other side, flip side, I must say that uh, in these nine months, the amount of COVID in Mumbai, uh, it's good news that just one client and one staff were infected in nine months. And that's something huge. In fact, they're beginning to believe that if they're users of heroin, they're not likely to catch COVID. That, that's their understanding. But um, yes, I think uh, there should be some way that they are given uh, these um, these medication by the NGOs who, who have uh, their support groups and we did it through our support groups. So it's, it's something that can be taken up by the Positive People Network. Thank you, Eldred. Um, final thoughts from you, Professor Laurent Nelson, any final comments from you? Over. 
I just want to say that I think COVID-19, this current pandemic has helped us really understand the, the need to connect the dots, that the social structural issues are intimately, they're inextricably related to HIV disparities uh, and point to the need to address all of it and not uh, look at HIV in a silo. So I'm glad that the IS is hosting this and that UNAIDS is paying attention to that too. Thanks. Matt, over to you, final thoughts, and I'll give um, Karen um, uh, the final, the woman, the final word. <laughs> Matt, over to you. Sounds good. No, just to say, I think, you know, look, we we are not on track to reach the, the global HIV goals. And I think that that means we, it's a moment for us to reflect, to say, what could we do between now and 2025 that would get us back on track for what we, what we're, the goal, global goal is for 2030, which is halting the HIV pandemic and turning it into something that, that is not a public health threat. What does that mean? That means that we're not necessarily measuring the right things. And we know that what gets measured gets changed. And so, I would like I would urge, and I think it's brilliant that the um, the IAS is really highlighting this work. That as we think about kind of structural po policies, as we think about racism, as we think about gender equity, we can put tools in the hands of communities to be able to both monitor the response, to collect data themselves, and to change the policies that are needed. If all of the kind of if all of the AIDS response were to focus on those few things for the next few years, I think we'd actually see us in a very different place than we have been over the last five years when we haven't focused on those nearly enough. Thanks so much. Thanks, Matt. Karen, over to you. Um, I'd like to say that don't stop supporting our economically um, technical uh, per community based uh, organization because we are the ones who are making actions and we are the ones who are making data in the Latin American regions. And also to start supporting uh, little organizations of young women with HIV because they are the ones to also who wants to do some actions. Thanks, Karen. So we've come to the end of our webinar. I, I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank the audience that's been really active and I hope we all feel energized. I mean, there's so much work to do. Um, it's Human Rights Day. It's a moment to step back and reflect and to reboot our efforts and to reach out to each other and collaborate. And I think we have a very clear uh, way forward. It's been laid out by the panelists um, in terms of measuring, being selective, focusing, getting the right data, uh, monitoring and holding to account. And, and there, I think we have a lot of work to do, but I hope we all feel empowered and energized by this session that we've got tools that we have got uh, platforms like the Policy Lab, that we've got people out there like, like Karen and like uh, Dr. Leron and, and, and uh, our, our other speakers, and that we have also got the UNAIDS Global Strategy that's going to hopefully give us this overarching framework um, in which we can all find ourselves in terms of um, these different pieces. Um, before I close, I also would like to thank the Swiss Agency for Development uh, and Corporations and Merck, Sharp and Dome that um, are supporting this work of the IAS. And I'd like to thank also Tara and Nelly for their excellent support in facilitating and making this webinar happen. So everyone, uh, thank you very much and I uh, hope you have a continued wonderful day or evening wherever you are. Uh, thank you and over and out. Thanks, everyone.